we're going to build an executable from the circular buffer example we saw earlier. Let's start by creating a new project. We'll save the project and call it exe build. Now we have saved our project, but we still have not added anything to it. So let's go to my computer, right click, and choose add. We're going to add a file to it. In this case, I've already structured the necessary files within the directory called my project. The necessary files include the circular buffer example vi and a subdirectory called subvis containing the circular buffer itself and a subdirectory called controls containing the relevant type defs. Now, when I choose to add the example vi, observe how the vi is added but also within our dependencies is listed the subvi and the type defs. So it's not necessary to add every single subvi as long as we make sure that we contain within our project all of the important vi's. And of course if we go to the files tab we can browse and see exactly where all the relevant files are located. To create an exe we right click on the build specifications and we choose to create a new one. Here we have a list of several choices in this section, we're going to talk about EXEs. When we do so, the screen My Application Properties comes up. This is where we can select from category to category all the relevant selections necessary to properly define our executable. Well, let's start at the top. Here we have the Information category. This is where we specify the build specification name. Instead of the default My Application, let's call this Circular Buffer exe build. Next we choose the target file name. The default is application.exe but let's change it to be circular buffer.exe. Next we choose the destination directory. By default LabVIEW chooses to put it in the C builds exe build directory but let's choose instead to contain it within our project. One of the benefits to this is that it allows us to back up our entire project at once. So we want to save it into my project directory. However, we don't want to put it in the root. We're going to create a new directory, call it exe builds. Open that directory up and choose current folder. This will ensure that whenever we build our exe, it's going to be placed here. Plus we can provide an optional description. The next category to choose is source files. Here we're provided with a list of all of the VIs in our project. We click on each of them, in this case there's only one, and we must specify at least one as the startup VI. This is going to be the VI which gets called when the executable starts. In addition we can choose other VIs to be included in the always included section. One of the reasons to include things in our Always Included section is when we have dynamically called VIs. This is a topic beyond the scope of this course. Dynamic VIs are VIs which aren't explicitly placed as sub-VIs. They're dynamically called using something called the VI server. Whenever we are using dynamically called VIs, we must make sure that all of the possible VIs to be called are included in our executable. And by placing them in the Always Included section, we can take care of that. The next section is destinations. This is where we can choose where each of these relevant files goes. Here, the first selection is circularbuffer.exe. Well, this is the executable that we're building. Here we can choose the destination path. We see by default it's being placed in the root of the directory that we specified. We could alternately choose to have it placed somewhere else, but this is okay. In addition, we can choose the destination type, whether it's a directory or an LLB, or we can choose to have certain files be placed into a new project library of a specified name. Second directory is called the support directory. This is where extra files can be placed. For example, if we wanted to include a PDF manual, some help files, some text files or configuration files, we could specify the location of our support directory. Next, source file settings. This is where we can specify the behavior and certain settings of each of our VIs. We see here by default we have our top level VI selected. We see it's listed as a inclusion type startup VI and the destination is that it's being placed into the circular buffer exe. We have the ability to customize its properties. For example here we can choose each of these settings title bar, menu bar, 
the window behavior, and so on. We can choose whether to use the VI property or if we unclick one of these, we can choose to specify the property. Let's do this now. Instead of default, let's make this a modal window. And instead of runtime window position of unchanged, let's leave it as centered. And this way we can change the behavior of our VIs without actually having to edit them. The benefit of this is that we can have the VIs perform a certain way when we build them into executables and have them behave a different way when we're debugging in the development environment. Let's click OK. We can also specify the save settings. By default, we see that we're not removing the front panel, but we are removing the block diagram. By removing the block diagram, we ensure the security of our code, making sure that no one can ever edit it. In addition, we can choose to apply or change the password behavior of the particular VI. We can choose to remove the password, apply a new password, or to not change it at all. In addition, we have the ability to rename the file. And if we click on dependencies, we can choose the same set of configurations for each of the files that are implicitly listed in our project. Next, we have the ability to specify an icon. We can choose to use the default icon file, or we can open the icon editor and specify our own icon. The icon editor allows us using a paint-like program to specify colors, shapes, and so on. And it also has the benefit of being able to paste graphics directly in here. Once we've defined an icon, we must save it. It's a good idea to save it within our project. We'll call it custom icon. close it, and then we deselect, use default, and then go ahead and add that icon we just created into the project. Once we've done that, we've effectively defined that icon to be the icon of our project. The next section is advanced. Here we can choose to enable debugging, also to specify whether or not it waits for the debugger on launch. Let's leave that off for now, but we're going to come back to that option a little bit later in this section. We can also choose to copy the error code files. That's if we specified custom error codes for our VIs in our application. We can also choose to use the default project alias file or a separate one. Same is true for the LabVIEW configuration file. Also, we can choose to pass all command line arguments to the application and whether or not to enable the ActiveX server. In most cases, these options can be left as default. Enabled debugging is one particularly useful one, which we will investigate. Next, additional exclusions. Again, for most applications, we would leave these as default. But for certain situations, you may want to disconnect the type definitions. That will save a little bit of space in our program. Also, we can choose to remove unused polymorphic VIs, remove unused members of project libraries, and modify the project library after removing unused members. This allows us to reduce the size of our project a little bit. Next, we can specify the version increment. If we turn on auto increment, every time we build an executable, it will automatically update. Or we can choose to specify the major, minor, fix, and build numbers ourselves. We'll leave it as auto increment. The next set of choices are related to the version information that we see in our executable. We see here it's automatically populated the product name and the legal copyright, as well as the company name that you've placed when you registered LabVIEW. Plus, we can specify an internal name and define the description again. Runtime languages, we can choose whether or not it supports all languages. And finally, we can choose to generate a preview. What this does is show us how it will appear, the files that are created, and the executable. Finally, once everything's been set up, we can choose to build the project now, or we can click OK to return to the Project Explorer. We now see that we have a build here listed under our specification. It's got the name that we chose, which is Circular Buffer EXE Build. And we can build this executable in a couple different ways. We can right click on the particular build and choose the build option. Alternately, from the menu bar, we see we have the ability to build all, build selected, or run from build. Run from build will build it and then run it. So let's right click on this now and choose to build the project. Depending on the size of your application and the number of VIs you have, an executable building can take from seconds, as in this case, to several minutes. Now that it's done, we click Done. 
and let's navigate to that directory. So we see here in the My Project directory our exe build project and the directory called exe builds. If we open that up, we see here that an exe has been created. Notice how the icon is blank. That's because when we defined our custom icon, we defined the large size icon, but not the small one. If we double click now to run this exe, we see that we now have our circular buffer example vi running. It's collecting data. When we click stop, it finishes. The last feature to investigate is debugging. Recall that one of the benefits of creating the executable is it allows us to deploy and distribute our code so that it can be run on a computer which doesn't run LabVIEW. However, one of the downsides is that it's very difficult to debug an executable once it's been created for the exact same reason. The source code has been removed. This problem has been partially solved by allowing us to debug executables on a computer which does contain the LabVIEW development environment. Let's investigate that now. Let's edit the properties of our project. The first thing we must change is if we go to our source file settings, let's customize the VI properties for our circular buffer example VI. And make sure we put back to default the window behavior. The reason for that is if we leave it as modal, we won't be able to properly debug it. Next, let's go to the advanced tab and click on the enable debugging. Also make sure it's set to wait for debugger on launch. Remember, whenever we change settings for an executable build, we must rebuild it to apply them. So let's do that now. And the executable build is complete. Let's minimize our project and open up the window to the directory containing the exe. Now, when we run the exe, the program opens, but in this case isn't running. We have the ability to manually run it now. Before we do that, though, let's return to the Project Explorer. From the Operate menu, we're going to choose Debug Application. Notice here we have the ability to specify a machine name and select an application. In this case, we're operating on the same computer, so it's local host. But the, as this indicates, it's possible to debug an application that's running on a different computer, just by specifying the computer name or the IP address. Then we click Connect. What this does is open up the Circular Buffer Example VI. In this case, we have access to the block diagram. Even though when the executable was built, the block diagram was removed, because we have the development system and the source code on this computer, we can actually access and probe and even put breakpoints in our code. Observe something else important. At the bottom left here, it says localhost slash circular buffer exe. This is indicating to us that although we're in the development environment, when we run it, it's actually going to connect in this location. We also still have, if we move the block diagram out of the way, not only the front panel in the development environment, but also the application here. And observe now, when we run, after hiding the Project Explorer so we can see both windows, when we run this VI, in the development environment, we're actually running the executable. So now we see that our probes are in place. If we were to click the stop button, we actually do fire our breakpoint. And even though we're running our executable, we can interrogate it and debug it properly.